in 1944, the 14-year-old African-American teenager by the name of George Stanley Jr. became the youngest person ever to face capital punishment in the United States. Today, we're going to talk about his story. And if you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on Patreon or Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Please support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. George lived in a small, segregated town of Alco, South Carolina with his father, George Stanley Sr., his mother, Amy, his brother, John, his sisters, Catherine and Amy, and his father worked at the local sawmill and his family lived in company housing provided to them by the sawmill. March 23rd, 1944, two young girls, 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 7-year-old Mary Emma Thames were riding their bicycles looking for flowers when they saw George and his sister Amy during their journey. They stopped to ask them if they knew where they could find maypops, which is a yellow edible fruit. It would be the last time that either of them were seen alive. Their disappearance prompted hundreds of residents including George Stanley's father, to come together and search for the two missing girls. But the girls would not be located until the following day when their bodies were discovered in a ditch. According to the medical examiner, both girls suffered blunt force trauma caused by an unknown weapon. While specifics of what happened that day remained unknown, a rumor floated around town that the girls had made a stop at a prominent white family's home on the day of the murder. But none of this had ever been confirmed, and police certainly never looked for a white killer. When it was reported that the girls had passed by the property of the family home earlier in the day and were seen talking to George Stanley later that evening, Clarendon County law enforcement came to the home. George and his elder sibling, John, were both apprehended by Deputy H.S. Newman for allegedly murdering the two girls. George was interrogated for hours in a small room without his parents or attorney. Despite the Sixth Amendment's assurance of legal counsel, this requirement was not consistently enforced in the United States until the Supreme Court decided in the ruling of Gideon v. Wainwright in 1963 that legal representation needed to be provided throughout a criminal proceeding. Stanley then was reported to have confessed to Deputy Newman. Newman wrote in a handwritten statement that I arrested a boy by the name of George Stanley. He made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron about 15 inches long. He put it in a ditch about six feet from the bicycle. John was then dismissed by police, but George was held under guardianship and was not granted contact with his parents. Following his arrest, his father was promptly fired from his job at the sawmill. Therefore, the Stanley family had to vacate their company housing. The family was also fearful for their well-being because the threat of lynching was a very real threat. Furthermore, Stanley's parents never saw him before his trial, leaving him without any type of support during the 81 days of his incarceration. The 14-year-old would then be taken to a jail in Columbia, South Carolina, almost 50 miles away from Alcu due to the threat of him being lynched. April 24, 1944, George Stanley Jr.'s trial would begin. Charles Plowden, Stanley's court-appointed attorney, was campaigning for a local office and did little to nothing to defend his client. Thus, he did not challenge the three officers' testimony that Stanley had confessed to the two murders. The prosecution then provided two separate versions of Stanley's verbal confession, one in which he allegedly helped one of the girls who had fallen in the ditch and ended up killing them in self-defense. In the second version, reportedly, Stanley followed the girls before initially attacking Emma Thames, then Betty June. All documents containing Stanley's confession were limited to Deputy Newman's account of the murders. The prosecution then called three witnesses, Reverend Francis Batson, who discovered the victim's bodies, and two doctors who had completed post-mortem examination. The court acknowledges bruising on the victim's private area raised the possibility of sexual assault. Stanley's defense counsel did not cross-examine any of the witnesses or present any witnesses of their own. The entire trial lasted just two and a half hours. More than a thousand people attended the trial in the courtroom, but no African-Americans were admitted. By the time of the trial, Stanley had not seen his parents in weeks, and the 14-year-old was surrounded in the courtroom by strangers. He was then tried before an all-white jury, since most African-Americans in southern states were excluded from jury roles. After the deliberation of less than 10 minutes, the jury declared Stanley guilty of murder. Judge Philip H. Stoll then sentenced him to death via electric chair. Remarkably, no appeal was ever submitted on Stanley's behalf. 
George Stanley Jr. execution was not without protest, though. The NAACP, Stanley's family, and the local churches all petitioned Governor Olin D. Johnston to show mercy to the 14-year-old defendant. Thousands of letters and telegraphs were sent in an attempt to plead for justice based on both basic fairness and Christian values. On June 14th, just two days before his scheduled execution, the governor visited George Stanley Jr. In his statement, the governor mentions George Stanley confessing to killing the girls in order to sexually assault the other. It's only after this that Stanley's parents were granted visitation to the youth while he was being held in the Columbia Penitentiary, and this was only due to, to the danger of a potential lynching. June 16, 1944, George Stanley Jr. entered the execution chamber of the South Carolina State Penitentiary in Columbia with a Bible tucked under his arm. Weighing just 95 pounds, the young boy was dressed in an ill-fitting striped jumpsuit. He jumped into an adult-sized electric chair that was difficult for him to fit in, and when he was asked if he had any last words, George simply and calmly replied, No, sir. The mask was placed over his face, but it was too big to fit properly. At 7.30 in the morning, officials flipped on the current, and George Denley was pronounced dead, and shortly thereafter, he would be buried in an unmarked grave in Crowley, South Carolina. In a span of 83 days, George Denley Jr. had been charged with murder, tried, convicted, and executed by the state. In the aftermath... In 2004, George Ferrison, a local historian in Alco, South Carolina, had read an article about the George Stanley Jr. case. After researching the case, Ferrison received assistance from South Carolina lawyers Steve McKenzie and Matt Burgess. The family of George Stanley Jr. continued to contend that his confession had been coerced and he had been with his sister at the time of the murders. Additionally, George Stanley's cellmate, Johnny Hunter, asserted that Stanley had denied any involvement in the deaths of Benneker and Thames and Hunter Hunter attests that he said, Johnny, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Why would they kill me for something that I didn't do? McKenzie and Burgess would then file a motion for a new trial in 2013. December 16, 2014, Circuit Court Judge Carmen Mullen vacated Stanley's conviction, ruling that his confession was most likely coerced. He was not properly defended and his Sixth Amendment rights had been violated. And the execution of the 14-year-old Stanley constituted cruel and unusual punishment. Thank you. This has been One Mike Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on Buy Me Coffee and Patreon page in the description below. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.